I'm going to share my experiences with COVID, which made this Indian gesture of greeting others universal. COVID taught us a lot of things. And these lessons will be used for centuries to come. I, Dr. Amit Nagpal, I'm here to share my side of story, a story from healthcare professional's point of view. So if you can recall, this all started in early 2020s. And I first paid attention to the news of this new virus outbreak originating from China and then spreading across the world. I remember in the early March, we heard about uh, outbreaks spreading across different parts of India. This was a time when we started with our own COVID task force. I was one of the core members of the task force. So in early March, we started seeing a lot of patients. So we decided to have a committee in order to start preparing for, for the COVID outbreak. Now, some may believe that lockdown did not help us because everybody got infected anyways. But it definitely gave us time to prepare in advance. It was very confusing. I had no experience of handling such kind of uh, situations medically or logistically. But we relied on the data or experiences of our colleagues from different parts of the world. So we laid our guidelines. The few issues or situations that we faced in the early part were to start with being one of the largest charitable hospital in Navi Mumbai was catering both COVID as well as non-COVID patients. The most difficult task was to accommodate suspected cases. If you can recall, RT-PCR used to take nearly three days to come. So when RT-PCR is not there and you have a suspected case, you cannot keep that case with non-COVID patients because there is chances of transmitting the infection to non-COVID cases. So we had to develop areas in the hospital itself where we can isolate such kind of cases. And as soon as we get the report, we can move them to different areas. So this was, again, part of the planning. And then it came on to us. COVID during the first wave peaked for nearly three to four months. And by the end of fourth month, things started to settle down. We gathered a lot of data, and the data was analyzed by researchers all across the world, which helped us to create our own guidelines. We were not sure whether we will have another wave or not, but we were prepared. We started training our students. You know, being a medical college hospital, you have a great pool of students. Back in the days, we had nearly 400 residents. So we decided to segregate them in different areas. Students from medicine stream will take care of critical patients or patients who are on oxygen. While others, like from surgical stream, will take care of slightly stable patients. So this was part of the plan. In 2021, what we noticed is there is a new wave which is coming up. And we were really, really excited to handle that. Although, of course, we all were tired. So it came. And what do you think? How did we perform with the policies or planning that we did, which we learned from the first wave? We failed miserably. It broke the backbone of healthcare system across the world. There was huge influx of critical patients, which were requiring oxygen, most of the hospitals across the country were facing issues with oxygen. I remember most of the colleagues remain uninfected during the first wave, but in second wave, everybody got infected. We were struggling with manpower, lack of resources, at some places, uh, lack of oxygen as well. It was a really difficult time. None of the medications worked. Now, you'll be amazed to believe this, that there is no strong evidence for any anti-COVID medication till date. We used everything, we tried everything. Now the question was, why few patients with severe COVID disease, COVID lung disease, improve 
with treatment and others couldn't. So I would like to share one incident which changed my perspective towards COVID. We received a patient, 45-year-old male, from a small setup, and the family got him shifted for better care at Diva Patil. Now, this patient had extensive lung disease. In medical terms, we call it ARDS. Such patients require a lot of oxygen, and they usually go into ventilator. So I remember counseling patient's wife and daughter every day, you know, preparing them for, for bad prognosis, because usually such patients don't make it. By, by then, I had enough experience of handling such kind of patients. So I was really skeptical about the outcome of this case. But the family was really hopeful. And back in the days, we used to do a lot of video counseling. So the patient can't see the relative, right, in person. We, we cannot allow relatives inside the ICU. So we had to do video counseling. And I used to see how the family is speaking to the patient and constantly encouraging him, asking him to just hang in there for a few more days. For weeks, there was no improvement. But to my surprise, after a month, patient started to improve. And this very patient, we were able to discharge after a really long time, almost after five months. This very patient changed my perspective towards my patients in the ICU. I learned two things from this. First, expensive medications don't really work in this kind of disease. And second, we need to motivate our patients. You know, just imagine, you're admitted in the ICU, you can't see daylight for days and sometimes week. You can't see other people's faces. Everybody is wearing PPE, mask. So everyone looks like a polar bear. You can't see human emotions. It's, it's a very depressing environment. So I started spending more time into patients' cubicles, talking to them, of course, if, if it's possible, asking them about their family, their jobs, just to, you know, start a conversation. And requesting them to just hang in there for a few more days. This really helped. The second wave lasted for nearly three weeks. And it was a really difficult time for all of us. Now, to conclude my talk, I would like to share a few take-home messages for you all. To start with, now, I don't want to scare you, but there's a conspiracy theory that the COVID could be a man-made disaster. Now, if it's a man-made disaster, in that case, there are more pandemics or such kind of outbreaks we might see in the near future. So as a nation, we better be prepared. In COVID, we learned how to work in a team. So it's time when community and the healthcare system come together and make sure that we implement strong policies to avoid all these issues. Now, India harbors bright minds. We have a lot of people who can make strong policies. But the problem is implementation of those policies. We don't do strict surveillance. As a result of which, you see people take advantage by stockpiling essential goods and medications. This is what the whole world faced. Now, we need implementation as well as strict surveillance in such cases. I, as a medical educator, I believe there is a strong revival happening in the field of medical education. It's taking its own pace, and I'm pretty much comfortable with that. We are changing the whole environment of medical cl classrooms from didactic lectures to student-centric experiential learning. And I'm happy that my institute is one of the pioneers in India. If you compare us with Western countries, of course, we are behind, but we are catching up with them. We're using medical simulation and trying to incorporate it in, in medical education. And I believe we are the first universities to do that for undergraduate medical education. So we need to use the technology to bridge this gap and to make good doctors. There's a very famous saying. We don't want to stop bad doctors from doing mistakes. We want to stop good doctors from doing so. 
And uh, I remember Mr. Joshi mentioned this part, suspension of disbelief. Well, I use this phrase a lot in medical education, medical simulation. In simulation, what we do, we try to create real lifelike environments, situations, using an advanced technology. It could be a simulator, could be anything, and train our doctors, nurses, paramedics in handling that. So you don't need another pandemic to train your doctors to manage that. You can do that safely in a controlled environment. And you can repeat it n number of times till your healthcare professions are comfortable to manage. The last and the most important message that I would like to share is more GDP to healthcare. Now, as you may know, uh, we are the fifth largest economy. You see, we uh, overtook UK and achieved this stage. And we are hoping to become the third largest. I've was shared with this data uh, in today's talk itself, very soon. So with huge economy, we need to have a strong healthcare system as well. Now I would like to ask, as a nation, how much percentage of our GDP goes into healthcare? Yes? Ah, come on, more than one person. We are not that bad. <laughs> it's roughly around 3.01. This data is from 2019. We don't have a recent data. 3.01%. And how much is UK spending, which we just overtook? Nearly around 10%. So for a strong economy, we need strong healthcare system. If we have a strong healthcare system and the nation is investing good amount of GDP into healthcare will have uh, good citizens, healthy citizens, which will definitely help us to bring our economy forward. So I thank you so much for uh, sitting patiently and attending through, through uh, the experiences that I wanted to share. So this is my message, more GDP to healthcare. Thank you.